Hi class. Hope you're having a great day. Snow day here, so we're going to do a Java video. That sounds like a good thing to do. In semester one of Java, there was a point where we talked about creating a class that defined a person. And if we think back about our object-oriented rules about what is a class, a class defines an object, and if we think about it a little more, a class defines the characteristics of an object by using properties or fields, and it defines the actions allowed an object through methods. So we can create our object definition and define all of the things that are important to that object. This is a UML document for our person class. And our person, we are not going to maintain a lot of information about our person object, just a person name and the favorite color. Both of these will be string values. In our class, we're going to have a constructor for that person object, and it's going to expect parameters for both of those class fields. We're not going to leave any of those um, up in the air. Then we are going to have a setter or a mutator method defined, and it's just going to set our favorite color. So we're going to have a parameter value passed in that's going to become the new favorite color of this person object. Um, we are not doing a lot of different methods here for brevity because we want to keep things quick and meaningful. Lastly, our person object is going to override the system object to string method so that we can output some meaningful information about our object. And to review, once we have this class created, if we are in a tester module and we want to create an instance of this person object, we would declare our person and name the person instance and then say that that person instance is equal to a new instance of a person object with these parameter values being passed in to the constructor. So those will set our instance values. Now I'd like to create this code and we're going to use a website that allows us to do some code visualization which you'll see what that is as we go. And I want you to be able to find this website in the future. So instead of just giving you a link to it, I'm going to search for it. And I'm going to search for something like visualize code. And there's the one that I want right up there on the top. We want this Python Tutor website. And of course, we're not using Python, but this facility will allow us to use Java so we can do some Java coding here. Now when I go to the website, notice that it just has a real basic editor window. I could copy and paste into this window if I had code already, or I can just type what I need here. My code drop-down type is already set to Java 8. Yours might be sitting at something else, so you want to make sure that you're working with Java. If you'll notice, the editor created a default class called your class name here and that class contains a main and so we'll leave this as our tester. So I'm going to go ahead and create some new code and I'm going to create our person class. Now as you code again you'll notice that this facility is not um, super friendly, but it's friendly enough to use and especially for us while we're in a video so that we can kind of stay on the same page. Now we decided our person class is going to have a couple of instance fields. We're going to have a string to hold the person name and a string to hold their favorite color. I'll go ahead and create my constructor. And again, I want to pass in a string that's going to be called pname and a string that will be called 
P color. And I like using P just for parameter. So we're passing in parameters there. And in this constructor, I want to set this instance of our person, this person's name field equal to whatever name is passed to us. And same with their favorite color. That'll end our constructor. And I need one method here, user defined method. That's going to be our set favorite color. This is going to be a void method. It's not going to return any value. It is expecting a string parameter of that color. And we'll update the favorite color in our instance to be this color that was passed to us. And then lastly, we set in our class diagram, our UML document, that we're going to override the toString method in this class. So I'm going to use the at sign override indicator. This is going to return a string. And I want to just return some nice information about our person. So their name is, do you want to use this? Plus their color. All right, so that should be everything that we need for that method. I'll finish it off and I'll finish off our class. Now we might be used to not having to type those closing curly braces depending on the editor that we're using, but this facility makes us do that on our own. Now that should be all for my person class, right? That's everything. I've got my my fields, my instance variables, I have my constructor. Notice I don't have a default no arg constructor because our person can only be constructed with the information that we need. We have our methods that we set are required for our person class. So all we need to do is create our tester. So I'm going to change this class name and make it person tester. And in the main, I want to create an instance of a person. So let's call it my person, like in our, our example. And it's a new person. And we want to pass in Joe Smith. And his favorite color is blue. Now I want to go ahead and print out my output. And of course, I'm going to just name my person instance because the default method to execute if I name a, an instance is the toString method. And since I've overridden the toString method, we should get out some information about our person. Check our closing curly braces. Everything looks good there. So I'm going to try now to visualize the execution of this code. Now, this brings up the CodeLens facility, which is really, really nice, and I hope that you like using it. I think it's very helpful in visualizing what's going on with our code. In this area of the window over here on the left, we have our actual code outlined, and it's line numbered for us, and it's very helpful. If we had had any syntax errors, we would not have gotten to this screen. That previous window um, would have explained the error to us and required us to correct that before we were able to continue. I'm surprised I don't have errors. I thought that there would be some to show you, but wow, look at that perfection. Now, our code is going to start out at the main, and that's why we see this little red arrow. The red arrow is saying, this is the next line I'm going to execute. After we've executed a line of code, we'll see a green arrow 
to show us that that line has just executed. So we're going to stop at each line of code and then be able to view what happens as the line of code is executed. So our first line of code is this code that creates our person object. So I'm going to click forward. And forward again. Now we see what's going on over here in this right side window where we're going to see some memory visualization and this is the visualization aspect. What we're seeing is that we have some frames or data held in memory but we also have created an object in memory. This is the instance of our person object. Now as our person object constructor begins to execute we see that person object is empty and has no information but the parameters that are being passed to it p name and p color do have values we have the value of joe smith which is what we supplied as that first parameter value and then we have the value of blue which is again our second parameter value argument since it has a value right now we're going to go ahead and click forward again and as we execute the constructors it seems like we have to click forward a little bit more than once because there are things going on behind the scenes I don't know if that's why so now we have finished executing the header for our constructor we have this this null object created but we're going to go ahead and execute the code that's within this constructor. First of all, we're going to set our P name value to our person name. So we see now our person name has that value. And then our favorite color. That's the end of our constructor method. So as we forward again, we will see that we have no return value from this constructor and return back to our main. Now over here, we're seeing some, some variances, right? Because it's showing we're just at our main. We don't have any objects, but really we do. We'll go ahead to this next line of code now. And it is able to access our person object. So our person object is sitting here. He has his favorite color of blue. We're going to execute this line of code to print out that information. We'll see that, first of all, we're going to execute our two string method. We're down here ready to execute that. And in our two string method, which is line number 20 in our code, we're looking at some information. First of all, we're looking at this person name. We see what that value is in memory. We're going to print that out or add it to our return stack. Then we're going to see our color. And finally, our return value is completely formatted with all of our information. We'll return that back to our main, which now prints that information out on the console. Now that completes our line, our, all of our lines of code. So if we wanted to, we could edit it and add additional things. Let's try it. Um, what if we create another person? And we visualize our execution again. As we go forward, we should see our constructor execute to create our Joe Smith or our my person instance. Then we'll see our code execute the constructor again to create Sam Spade. Now we already have this one person instance out here. As we create our second one, again we start out with null values. We use the data that was passed into our constructor to update our values and then return back to our main. 
Now in our main, we really have access to both of these different person objects. My person is Joe Smith, person two is Sam Spade. We know in our output, we're only going to be printing out Joe. We didn't do anything with person two. So let's print out Joe's information and we're done. Now, we have access to as many of these different person objects as we would like to create. All right, so that's our first step in our person object, our person class. We pretty much did this last semester and you should be able to find the videos and things like that on that on YouTube if you're not feeling comfortable with creating that person object. But it's pretty straightforward. We have our person object that has specific values and specific actions that it can perform. Now, in this chapter, chapter 13, we're talking about inheritance. And inheritance gives me the ability to take a class, like our person class, and extract or inherit from that class to create another class. See if this will open right. Here we go. So here's our UML for this. In this example, I have my person class. And I'm going to make my person class abstract. And an abstract class is a class definition that's like a template, but it doesn't have enough data elements or actions to make it into a complete object. In your textbook, they use the example of a, um, a, an object um, shape, some sort of shape and the shape itself is the abstract class and then when you want to do the measurement of a circle you have a circle class that inherits that basic shape well in our case we have our basic person our person has their name and their favorite color and that's really all we have to worry about with our person when we make our person into an abstract class we're going to add the keyword abstract to the class definition and that's going to mean that we can no longer create an instance of a person object because it's too abstract. We need more concrete information. So we're going to use an employee. So in our scenario here, a person could be an employee, a person could be a student, a person could be, you know, someone from the community. So we're going to keep track of this diff these different types of person objects that are important to our company. And the first type of person that is important to us is an employee. So when we inherit from an object, we show that um, connection on our UML diagram by an arrow that points to the object that's being inherited from. So we can almost think of this as a parent-child relationship. For every parent person up here, I could have many children employees, many employees that use the same class definition and keep track of the name and color. And then I will be adding information about the employee ID or extending the person class. So I could extend that person class and add all sorts of additional information if I wanted to. But again, in the, in the case of brevity, we're just going to add one additional class field to this object to make it into an employee. So let's try some things in our code lens. I'm going to back, go back to the edit code window. And the first thing I want to do is add that keyword abstract to our person class definition. Now I'm going to try to run our program. And we receive an error that our person is abstract, cannot be instantiated. We cannot create an instance of a person. So just that one little keyword difference made all the difference in the world, didn't it? So I'm going to add our new employee class. And we don't want a lot of information here, just the employee ID string.
And of course, I'm adding all of these classes into the same file per se here because I'm using this code lens where I'm using um, NetBeans are one of my IDE products. I would have each class in its own .java file as recommended. Now my employee class again has a string for the employee ID and then in our constructor we're going to say we want to have this employee ID And we also are going to be asking for the name and the color. Now I'm going to change this a little bit and make it be PID to be consistent with my others as parameter. And when somebody creates an instance of an employee, I'm going to be concerned about getting that information to my person class because my employee is very dependent upon my person. I can't really have an employee without that person base. So I'm going to specify that inside my class, lost my cursor, sorry, that the base class needs the P name and the P color pass to it. And then this employee ID is going to be equal to the employee ID that was passed to us. So in this constructor, we're saying I expect three parameters to be passed in to create an instance of an employee. Two of those parameters should be passed on to the base constructor. So that means internally the system will execute the base constructor to build this information about my new employee. Then after the, the base person is constructed, that person will be extended by adding the employee ID to create an employee instance. Oop, and I put base and that's the wrong keyword just to really point it out to you. That is our base class, but it's also referred to as our super class. And when we're passing the parameters to that constructor, we want to specify the super parameter. Now, the other things that we need for our employee, we have our constructor. And the only other thing we need to do is overwrite our two string. That's how you override. Now our two string could actually be dependent upon our our super class or our base class two string. So let's see what we can do here. I want to try some things. See what kind of syntax we can get going. Now, first of all, in our two string, we want to return, and we want to return the ID and we're going to call it this employee ID. And I'm going to go ahead and add a space after that because after that I want to do can I call the super dot to string to return more? Hmm, let's try it. So remember, as a programmer, we're trying to keep from um, having redundant code. We want to reuse things as much as possible. So we're going to try to reuse that code in our super class, our base class, and we'll see if we have got that syntax correct. Oh, I need to change my tester, huh? Okay, hang on just a second. I'm looking because I 
I think that that super dot two string should work. We'll see. Okay, we can't create a person, so we need to instead create employees. So this is going to be an employee. I'm going to even call my person. How lazy is that? Huh? Now, for our new employee class, the first parameter we're passing is a ID. So I'll add that in. Get rid of this one. Okay, you're right. Too lazy. My employee. And my employee. Now let's try it. Okay, so it says that my um, parameters are different. So as I am calling things, it's saying, I don't really know what you want to do with this. Hmm. Well, I said when we started that our employee class was going to inherit from the person class or extend the person class. And nowhere in our code are we specifying that that's to happen? So that's causing some trouble. And the way we specify that is, in our new class statement for our employee, we're going to use the extends keyword. And we're going to tell Java what class this new class is based on. So let's see if things are happier now. So this is, sorry, this is just a little um, box asking us if we want to give feedback to this site. I'm going to close it. Now we're all good to go here. We're going to create an instance of our employee. We click forward. And here is our employee instance. We can see now we're in the employee constructor. We've allocated an empty or null employee. And we're at line 10 ready to execute this line of code that specifies that two of these parameters should be passed to the superclass constructor. We see then the person constructor being executed. We're again passing those data elements down and we will start constructing that by populating the name and the color and then returning back to our subclass where we will continue execution by populating the employee ID. That'll finish up the construction of our employee. So now we have a fully built employee instance in memory named my employee. Now if I execute the to string, we'll see we start out building our return string. We specified that we wanted to execute the toString method in our superclass. So we see that branch occur, where now we're executing that toString method. It's building its output, and it will return that. And then our new toString method will put all of that information together to return our updated output. And now our output has the employee ID, their name, and their favorite color. So we have accomplished extending our person class by adding information to make that person into an employee. So that gives us a really, really good feeling for how we can do these kinds of things with an abstract class. Now in our case, we didn't have to make the person class abstract. We could have allowed instances of plain old persons to be created, but we've decided that that would violate our rules of our system, and so we're not going to allow that. Now, one last thing as we're editing our code. In our UML diagram, 
for our person employee. We had an update here. And the update is that we're going to add an abstract method. And an abstract method is one that, again, is defined in an abstract class. And what this abstract method says is, I'm going to create a signature for this method in this abstract class. I'm not going to have any code. It's, it's too abstract. But I'm going to say, this method must be implemented by any subclass that extends or inherits from me. So in our person class, we're going to create this um, method called getID. Again, it's going to be an abstract method without any code. And then we'll see how our employee class is forced to implement that same method with the same signature enabled in order to inherit from a person. Let's try that. So in our person class, right here after our two string, we're going to put abstract, look at my cheek here, I have the access level first, so I'm going to put public abstract, and then our return value, which is going to be a string for this method, and then our, our method name, get ID. We don't need any parameters passed into this method, and we're going to end it with a semicolon. So this says, I expect any subclasses that inherit from me to implement a method called get ID because I know that I need that to occur, but it's too abstract for me to implement in this actual class. Now, I haven't put that code in to our employee class yet to implement that, that method, so let's see what happens if we try to run it. Employee is not abstract, true, and it does not override abstract method get ID. Okay, so it's saying you must override that method. So in our employee class, we'll update it to do that. It's an override, and we're going to override get ID. And for our method, all we want to re do is return um, ID. return that and then that should be it. Now because we have a new get ID method I could actually change our get string or our to string sorry to use that right what if I wanted to do some other formatting or something in it it might be important so I'll change that to use the get ID method. Again, think about it, I might be putting, you know, some sort of stars or something in there. So I want to get rid of this predecessor also, that prefix. Now I should be returning ID plus the employee ID, which is what I had before. And then I will be adding a space and then the output from the super class. Is that all we need? Let's try it. Again, saying, yeah, hey, you fixed that. Do you want to tell me if I helped you? That's all right. You did help me. Now, I'm going to start executing my code, creating my employee. I'm going to call my superclass constructor to build those components. Return back to my subclass to finish my extension. Return back to the main because I now have my employee built. And now I'm going to try to output that employee. I'm calling the toString method of my employee class. And the first thing it's going to do is call the new getID method. And it's, it's looking down there at what our ID is. It's going to return that value, ID, and then the employee ID. And then we're going to call our superclass. 
to do its two-string method and return its information. And finally, at the end, we should have output from our main for that entire employee's pieces of information. So really great. We've got everything separated. We're using the methods that we should use. We have a constructor here for our employee that calls the superclass instructor. Great. Everything looks good just the way that we want it to be. Now you'll find some of this information in Canvas. And I have it set up for you under week one. Sorry about that. And it's called week one code chapter 13 abstract class. And you'll see there are four pages of information that will lead you through doing all of these steps, which you don't need to do because you've already done it in the video. But you do need to do this part. Now I'd like you to extend our application a little further by adding a student subclass. So our student is going to inherit from our person in the same way our employee did. One small change, our student ID needs to be an integer. So in your get ID method for the student, you're going to have to do something to make sure that that ID is formatted as a string to be returned. Other than that, things should be very straightforward and very similar to creating the employee. Again, if you go backwards throughout this little mini unit, you'll see that the code lens information should show up on your screen. There it is. So this is not exactly the same code as I did with us together in the video, but very similar. So you should see all of this information available to you on Canvas. If you have trouble extending the person class to create the student, please let me know or feel free to contact the Speckman Learning Center. We can go over there for some tutoring if that's something that you feel like would benefit you. Anyway, I hope this has been helpful. I think it was pretty um, interesting to create and I really like the Code Lens facility and I hope that you'll use it if necessary if you want to see how things are visually executing. I know we can do that using the debugger in NetBeans and I, I do like doing that too but I like the way the Code Lens visualizes these objects in memory so that you can kind of see what's happening there. Just awesome. Anything we can do to visualize what's going on in our code I think is helpful to all of us. So again, let me know if you need anything. Thank you.